Thank you so much for joining us today for the message. As always, I wanna encourage you to make sure that you are planted in a local church um, wherever you live so that you are able to serve and worship together with others. But we do pray that our church is a great resource to you and many others. And if our church has been a blessing to you, I would encourage you to join us in financially giving so that we can continue to provide resources just like today's message, as well as many other things abroad. Thank you again. God bless. We're in this series, Sermon on the Mount, and as I mentioned last week, if you were here, if you weren't, you can always check those out on our site or app, but it's going to be a long series because we're going to take time to walk through it, and so each of the Beatitudes, um, we're going to take one week to go through that, and last week we started with what is the Sermon on the Mount as a whole, it's all about the kingdom of God and the characteristics of the people of God in his kingdom, but the kingdom is not just an off, long ways from now, one day Therefore, we don't really take that into account today. No, the kingdom is here and now and will be fully consummated at the coming of Jesus Christ. We learn and are given the standards of God's kingdom when we look at the Beatitudes. Last week, we talked about blessed are the poor in spirit. And we talked about that doesn't mean that you walk around with a long face and sad all the time. No, it's an intellectual uh, understanding or logical understanding that you come to God bringing nothing but your sin, your brokenness, your frailty. And God, in his gracious mercy, saves us from our sins. And it's such a powerful thing to think about that we don't come to God with money in the bank. We come to God bankrupt. We come to God impoverished when it comes to our spiritual state. And God, in his grace, through his son Jesus Christ, gives us life. Today is an immediate following of that. I'm using Psalms 51 to really flesh out the fourth verse or the second um, beatitude in Matthew chapter 5 where it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so it's an immediate play off of, very strategically placed, right after, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so in Psalms 51 this morning, I hope you're there. Um, If you're not, you can watch on the screen behind me. This is a Psalm of David, and this gives you a little bit of background to it. It's most likely right after Nathan the prophet came and spoke truth to David in his sinful state because he was living in sin and hoping no one had found out. And that's where a lot of us are at at different times in our own life. Having sin in our life, not wanting it to be exposed because we don't want to deal with the shame and with the guilt without realizing that when our sin finally is exposed for what it is, we have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness and to receive it because of Jesus Christ so that we don't have to walk with our bones, as it says in Psalms 32, rotting within us and having to have a conscience that's continually guilty. Rather, we are set free because of Christ. Psalms 51, it says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. For I know how, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth, in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You do not, and you will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
Do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifice and in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And that is the word of the Lord this morning. This is in response to David's sin. David's sin specifically with Bathsheba. You all remember the story, I'm assuming, in 2 Samuel, where Bathsheba is bathing on a lower rooftop level, and he's obviously higher up. And rather than seeing her and then turning back and saying, oh, wow, I, shouldn't, I should not look upon her nakedness and so on and so forth, he stares and meditates on that fact and says, not only do I see her, but I want her. He has a sexual relationship with her. She has a baby, but she's married. She's impregnated. She's married to Uriah. Uriah is not just some guy. Uriah is one of his top 30 when you read about David's mighty men. He's in the top 30 count. Like he's somebody, somebody good, somebody right, because we find that out. When David realizes she's pregnant, he says, Joab, his commander, send in Uriah. I, I need him to be back. His whole goal was to get him to sleep with his wife so hopefully he could cover the whole thing up. Uriah said, I will not stay with my wife while the men are out there in the field in battle. And therefore, no matter what David did, he would not go to his wife. So he sent a letter with David, his own death note. He said, give this to Joab. Joab saw the letter and it said, send the men to the front, including Uriah, and then pull the men back without letting Uriah know. He does this very thing, kills Uriah, takes Bathsheba as his wife, and then for some months feels as though he has the whole situation covered up. Nobody knows. And the problem with this entire part is, is that the one who does know is the one who matters. God knows. It says that everything is naked and exposed before God, according to Hebrews 4.13. There, there's nothing that God doesn't see, that God doesn't know, that God's not aware of. And God knows exactly our motives behind what we do far better than we do because we can justify, as we talk about often, we can justify the things that we do in our own life. And so this is when Nathan, the prophet, comes to him. And you've got to realize Nathan being a man of God, you'd say, well, he should just go right to him. Once God showed him and told him he had committed adultery and had Uriah murdered, that he should just go straight forward and tell him. But you've got to realize, just because you go and tell the truth to someone, which is the right thing to do, doesn't mean you're not going to die. To say that David's not capable of murder is to say that he didn't murder Uriah, and he did. I mean, obviously, he will do, and here's the deal, for so many of us, we could never imagine ourselves doing certain things until we are put into a certain situation to the point to where we begin to say, well, I would have never thought I would have lied like that. I never thought I would have cheated. I never thought I would have committed this act, this crime, this felony. I never would have imagined myself to get to this point because we're not, all of us would say this, we're not those kind of people as though those kind of people are somehow different without realizing we all are sinners and have a sin nature within us and are capable. I know we don't want to believe this a lot of times, but we are very much so capable of horrendous things. Horrendous things in our own lives. And so Nathan comes and confronts him. And this is, a, this is a huge blessing. A lot of times we're like, I don't want to deal with what's happening in my life. Do you understand that the sooner you deal with what's happening in your life, the sooner you can heal? I mean, come on. The sooner that the light of God is exposed in your life, the sooner that we can call sin for what it is. I don't know if you noticed, but the words that David uses, he goes, it's sin. It's iniquity. It's transgression. He's pulling out the full vocabulary of the Old Testament of using Different words to describe the bent and perverseness and the wickedness and the breaking of trust and all these things that have occurred. The sooner we can do that, the sooner we can be healed. I get it. Nobody wants to do that. Primarily, why do you not want to do that? Because of the consequences. And how will people look at you? What will people say about you? How will people think about you? But we're asking the wrong questions. Did you notice what I just said? What's going to happen to me? The consequences. Could I lose my job? Could I lose my reputation? Could I lose my respect? Could I lose my friends? Could I lose this? Without recognizing, we're asking the wrong questions. The first question is, what about God? Did you see how that worked out just then? 
I gave you human answers and questions to how most of us deal with things. But in reality, as a follower of Jesus, who has a relationship with God, our first and foremost should not be what is the consequence, but rather, what have I just done against God? Look at verse 4. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil. Did he commit a sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Did he commit a sin against Uriah? Yes. Did he commit a sin against the nation as a whole, for he is the representative of the nation as the king? Yes. So is this to say that he only is sinning against God and no one else? No, this is powerful language, strong language to recognize that first and foremost, every sin I commit, which means every sin you commit, is against God, for it's against his very nature, against his very character, against who he is. It's a breaking of trust. That's where we get the word transgression. Sin, it's missing the mark. Iniquity, it's perversion and twisted, and it's to be weighed down. Not with good, but with evil. Psalms 51 is one of seven out of the 150 psalms that are recorded in Scripture that's called a penitent psalms. It's the most well-known, too, as well, because, I mean, I know a lot of you are like, I I've read that or I've heard some of that stuff that you just read in there. I mean, it's definitely one I would encourage you today and this week to really just meditate on and, and think about. And, and it's, it's important because where does David start out? What kind of man do we find in Psalms 51? Do we find a king high and lifted up on his throne with power, with pomp? No, we do not find a king like that. No, we find a person who is broken before God for he has been exposed and he is seen as he is rather than as a lot of times we like to create the facade that we are. He can see himself in light of who God is in the sinful nature of what he's just committed. Because here's the thing. This is what's so scary for a lot of us. We can get so caught up in how good we think we are the whole time never looking to God to see him. And to see his standard without realizing and recognizing the hardness that's become part of who we are. Hardness of heart. Extremely judgmental. Lacking in mercy. I mean, y'all know, know as well as I do what I'm talking about. This can especially happen when our lives are, from the outside looking in, well put together. Because we appear to have more to stand on if you do have your life fairly well put together. And people look to you. But don't ever lose sight of looking to God. Or you will become arrogant. I will become arrogant. Filled with pride. And lack the humility that it takes to what? Walk humbly with my God. With your God. With our God. Which is the command of God himself. It's the very nature of being poor in spirit. And as we said, to mourn flows right out of being poor in spirit. David's longing is not to have the consequences removed. Did you notice that? All of these verses, 19 verses, 17 that's specifically about what's happening. How many times do you hear him say, Lord, please, out of everything that just happened, just take away the consequences. Where did you read that? Where, where are the verses? Now, if the consequence has to do with his relationship with God, then yes. But if the consequences have to do with, Lord, I, I don't want to be punished for this, you don't read it. It's not there. His concern, as well as our concern, should be our relationship with God above everything else. See, if you're more concerned with your consequences to the actions that you've taken that you know are evil... If you're more concerned about that as a Christian, you ought to bring into question your own spirituality. I'm just, say it one more time. If all you ever worry about is when you do wrong, what are the consequences from a physical human standpoint rather than what is it that I've just done in my relationship with my heavenly father? Like if, that's, if we don't go there, there, there is something fatally flawed about our understanding of what it means to follow Christ and to be in relationship with him. For it says what? Grieve not the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Well, that would insinuate that obviously our actions and our attitudes can, can grieve God. So we look 
at what we see here. And when we, when we think about blessed are those who mourn, immediately I'm just like, that doesn't seem very blessed at all to me. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically a, a paradox, which is, as G.K. Chesterton said, it's a truth that's set on its head, which causes you to look at it. You're like, what in the world? I don't, I don't understand how it's blessed to be mourning, right? I mean, why, why do we mourn? And we probably don't use that word many times. Like, why are you crying? Why are you highly upset? Why are you angry? What's causing you to mourn, right? Well, the death of a loved one or a close friend, I mean, obviously that would cause someone to mourn. Being mistreated, uh, perpetually being mistreated or habitually being mistreated by someone would most definitely cause you to mourn, especially if you're in a situation where you're like, I can't, or apparently it feels as though I can't do any. Thing about this. I just read an article a few weeks ago about a, a young boy. I can't remember if he was 10 or 12, but either way, he was a great baseball player, they said, and everything else. Appeared to be happy. Always shot his dad a text when he got home from school. Something along the lines, I'm home. Um, I'll see you soon. About to do my homework. Something like that. On one day, did not get the text. Came home to find their son had committed suicide because he had been perpetually been bullied by other students about his clothes, about his weight, about all these other things. And you're just like, how can we be so cruel? And then we go, those people, what, what about, those people are us. When you say that nation, you're talking about people. People make up a nation. When you talk about our nation, you're talking about People like us who make up a nation. How are we to live? What are things we mourn about? Failing at something important to us? Letting someone down when they were counting on us? I mean, there's, there's different things. And I mean, when I take a first glance at blessed are those who mourn, I'm just like, that doesn't, it just doesn't make any sense because I read in Scripture, right? I mean, you read it as well as I do. In Proverbs, it says, laughter is good medicine, right? That's good medicine. Ecclesiastes 3, 4. It says what? There is a time to laugh. There's a time to weep, but there's also a time to laugh. Remember Sarah and Abraham, actually. I was thinking about this this morning. Sarah and Abraham, when the Lord tells them after all these years, you are going to have a child. Abraham's going to be 100 years by the time the child's born. Sarah's going to be 90. And what does Sarah do? It doesn't say she laughed like hilariously out loud. It says inside, internally. She, she laughed when she heard the Lord tell Abraham, uh, this time next year... You're going to have a child. And it says that she laughed. And it doesn't say that God rebuked her. How dare you laugh at what I said? Didn't say that. The Lord told her to name her son Isaac, which means laughter. So when we find this, I'm over here just like, well, Jesus, I mean, I don't. Last week I was like, does that mean we need to be always sad? And this case means that we need to always be tearful and mourning. And I don't think so. Abraham Lincoln, he said it this way, if, if I do not laugh, I would die. If I don't laugh, and if y'all know anything about his marriage and obviously the stress he was under during the Civil War, you would understand why he says, if I don't laugh, I would die. G.K. Chesterton said this way, the secret of life lies in laughter and humility. So what is Jesus saying? Have long faces. He is not saying that. This beatitude goes with the first one, as I mentioned Kent Hughes says it this way, the intimate connection of this second beatitude with the first is beautiful and compelling. The first beatitude, blessed are those are the poor in spirit, is primarily intellectual. Those who understand that they are spiritual beggars are blessed. The second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, is its counterpart, emotional counterpart. It naturally follows that when we see ourselves for what we are, our emotions will be stirred to mourning. So what then is Jesus talking about in these? This is where we start in our notes. I hope we got them out. Number one this morning is this. Conviction of sin leads to contrition over sin. Conviction leads to contrition. <clears throat> contrition or to be contrite in spirit means to be broken. It's a metaphorical way of saying that you broke something in pieces and now it can be mended or properly built back up. Same thing. We must first be convicted of sin in our life before we're ever going to get to the point where we're just like, man, that's wrong. If you're unaware that it's wrong and you feel like it's right, then you'll keep on doing something even if it's wrong. So the word of God and God himself, through his word, helps us to recognize what is and is not right. What is 
wrong. No one wants to talk about sin, though, do they? I mean, that's a horrible subject. You can't build large congregations talking about sin. Joel Osteen actually says this. I'm not going to talk about sin, hell, or judgment, or anything like that, because I, I feel like people are beat down too much, and therefore I want to only give them happy thoughts and tell them how they can do better. And like, you don't get to decide as a pastor the message. Like, the message is there. It's your responsibility to study it, to apply it, to share it, and to equip those who are under the teaching that you are giving. Like, you're not the one who makes up the message and decides to edit pieces of it. Like, he's the author, we're not, right? And so the idea behind that is absolutely ludicrous because if you never tell someone who has cancer that they have cancer and rather you want them just to feel good about their situation, like you're a horrible doctor. You know, if you're a lawyer and you read a document that says that basically the person who brought it to you is in a heap of trouble and you don't say anything about the trouble that they're in because you don't want them to have a bad day or a bad week or a bad year and you just say, well, I think things are going to look up for you later. Here's your document back. Go ahead and pay me the money and we'll... We'll be on about our business. No, you're horrible. Like you're a bad lawyer. Go, you can go through any scenario that you want. If we don't deal with the problem, we're missing the whole point. We're missing the whole point. Charles Colson in When God Speaks said this, if pastors preached on sin, many would flee the church pews never to return. But we must, we must talk about it. We must understand it better. Because, see, there's a vast difference between knowing the right answer and actually having the right heart. Say that one more time. There's a vast difference between knowing the right answer theologically. Like, I know, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't even desire to do it. And therefore, I don't even attempt to do it. Like, there's a vast difference between having the right answer and having the right heart, which then follows with the right actions in line with those things. Again, look with me in Psalms 51. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. What is he saying? Have mercy. When you ask for mercy, that means you don't have a leg to stand on. That means you don't have something in your back pocket or you don't have a card that you're ready to throw on the table to say, aha, I got you. Like you're saying, I don't have anything. Help me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Wash me. Cleanse me. Blot out. You ever wash clothes? Any of you moms out there, kids playing sports, especially baseball, white pants? They look good until you wear them on the field. The idea seems good. The execution seems bad, right? You get in there and you're like, I don't have enough bleach to get all the stains out of the knee or hip area from them sliding and playing or whatever it is that they're doing. It's the same thing. The idea to blot out is to remove by this washing process. My sin is ever before me against you and against you alone. So David is feeling the, the overall weight and the overall burden of what he has done. And he's seeing himself in light of who God is and seeing his sin for what it is rather than trying to cover it up. Rather than trying to explain it away. Rather than trying to say, oops, I slipped. Too many times with our sin, it's like we give a half acknowledgement of it. It's like, well, if I wouldn't have been put in this situation, I wouldn't have done it. So, I, yeah, I know it was wrong, but I was, no, 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 like own it. We as people, we love to own good things about ourselves. We hate to own, rightfully so, the things that are not great, the sin in our own lives. But until you take and I take responsibility for our shortcomings, for the missing of the mark, you'll keep doing it. And that's not to say it's a cure-all. Like, you will keep fighting sin as long as you live in these mortal bodies. You will keep having thoughts. You will keep doing and saying some things that you just feel like, Lord, are you... heal me, save me. What does that make us do? We to return to the Lord again and again and again to declare our dependency upon him again and again and again. First, we're convicted of our sins, and then we experience mourning and contrition and then weeping. When was the last time you mourned for the sins of a nation? Well, I mean, when was the last time? Because this is not just mourning. Not just mourning about your own personal sin, but it's also mourning about sin in general, specifically about 
the world as a whole. When was, I mean, when was the last time it even bothered you, short of when it bothered you because someone took something that caused you a headache, right? And I still remember a couple of years ago when ISIS was basically at its peak and they were showing all those videos, and it was before one of the videos was taken off because YouTube began to graphically edit all those videos. And one of them was this whole group of these militant ISIS people in some village, I believe, in North Africa. <clears throat> and they had a Christian. Christian was not dressed in church garb or anything else, just humble attire, had him down on his knees with something around his neck to hold him tight. And whatever the guy was saying was basically, Allah, our God, and so on and so forth, has given us the victory. And then goes forward and takes a dull, what appears to be a dull knife, and slits his throat. But he doesn't just cut his throat, and you're just like, it's too graphic. It's just like, but this is real. Falls down, of course, and whittles until he takes off his head and then sets his head on his chest. I still remember, like, very vividly in my, in my office, watching that. And just being overwhelmed by just emotion, tears, all the above. And being so angry. Like angry like, Lord, the, the, the prayers of the Psalms. How long, oh God, how long? And just praying, and, uh, praying in the mix between, Lord, save them or eradicate them. <laughs> and I don't even know, maybe that's off a bit on my prayer. But it was like, save them, show them your light or eradicate them, eradicate this evil, just, but I'll admit openly, man, there's so many times in life in general when I should be weeping, and I'm over here like, it's not happening to me personally, it's not my problem, and that is not right, but I'll ask you another question to make it a little more personal, when was the last time in your life you mourned over your sin? When was the last time in your life that you mourned over your sin? This would be worth taking down because some of us are going to be like, I, I don't, I don't remember. I, I say it quick during my prayers, Lord, forgive me of my sin. But when, when was the last, because this is what this means. Blessed are those who mourn. That, that's not means that you're always walking around with a sad face about everything. No, no. It's blessed are those who do what? They mourn over their sin. They mourn over not only their sin, but just a sin in the world as a whole. They mourn over the situation of fallen humanity. You know, like, but if I thought about that all the time, Josh, like my whole life would be different. You're right. It would be different. It doesn't mean you're not filled with joy. That's a command. Rejoice always in the what? In the Lord. Rejoice. So how do, you, how do you counterbalance this? Well, Jesus is making us into the full image. Full image. Conform fully to be like him. To be able to fill his weight. When was the last time you mourned over your sin? Kent Hughes, he said this, true Christianity manifests itself in what we cry over and what we laugh about. So often we laugh at things that we should weep over and weep over things that we should laugh at. In our heart of hearts, what do we weep about? What do we laugh about? One of the scariest places to be is not just in sin, but it's to be at a point of denial of sin. Like to be like, I, I hear what you're saying, Josh, but I just don't, I don't really see myself in the scenario that you're given, and so... I don't see sin in my own life. Like, that is honestly a worse place to be than someone who's just engaging in sin. It's just like, man, I'm, oh, why am I doing this? Compared to someone who's like, I just don't think I'm all that bad, to be honest with you. And you're like, well, I don't understand. Okay, look on the screen. First John, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is just, or he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. Y'all following that? If we say we have no sin in our lives, we are deceiving ourselves. If you're sitting here this morning, watching this morning, or whatever it is, 
If you say, in my life, I honestly really don't have all that much sin there. It's just like you are deceiving yourself. Just because you might have gotten to the point in your own walk with Christ that you don't do all the taboo things in the Christian world, what about your heart? What about the pride? What about the haughtiness? What about you name it? But if we confess, he's just and he's faithful to forgive us. And if we say we have not sinned, then what? We make him a liar. We make God out to be a liar, which this leads me to my second. So we need to flesh out now. We see what mourning looks like. Now we need to flesh out what it does. Point two, mourning over our sin leads us to Christ to receive the mercy of God. This is, we're playing the same role as David. Crying out to God and saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. And even as followers of Christ, we continue daily to bring our sin to him and say, Lord God, heal me. Lord God, forgive me. Change me. So how are we to mourn over our sin that in many cases we're just like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel all that bad. Last week we talked about it, to be poor in spirit doesn't mean to fake it till you make it. Same here about mourning, it's like don't fake it till you, till you make it. Like oh, I gotta well up tears, I gotta start cutting up onions every single day to go ahead and make something happen in my face. Like I don't know how to do this. This is not here to be a talk about how do you well up emotions. Remember what emotions are in the first place. They are a response to something happening in your life. No one has to tell you to be joyful when great things happen to you. You are joyful and therefore you tell people about it. No one has to tell you to cry tears or to be sad when something in your life that seems to be tragic or is tragic happens. You have those emotions and therefore those things occur. It's the same way that until we get to a point that the reality is we are spiritual beggars to God, but yet brought into his family, therefore overjoyed as children of God, until we can recognize who he is, who we have become, we will never get to the place where we begin to say, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. You can't conjure this stuff up. So how do we do it? I believe in many ways we need to have an encounter with God daily, like a daily encounter with God. A daily encounter when you walk in your neighborhood, if, say, you do that. A daily encounter with God when you're going through the grocery store. A daily encounter with God in the midst of your kids or going and doing life in general. A day, an encounter with God at your work. We spend the vast majority of our lives not inside of our homes, but with other people in some area, in some place, at what we call work. Your work is intended to be a purpose of worship wherever you go. You're the people of God filled with the Spirit of God. You don't have to wait till a Sunday morning for an hour and 15 minutes to somehow worship. Every day. On the pond, at the ball field, wherever you're at, worship. Encountering God. Thanking God. And being equipped to walk in the Spirit of God. You see, Isaiah was a man of God, but he was wrecked on the day that he met and saw a vision of God. Isaiah 6, y'all remember that? Isaiah 6, it says, in the year that Uriah, or, or, uh, Uzziah, sorry, not Uriah, Uzziah died. He said, I saw a vision of the Lord high and lifted up in the temple, and that his robe covered the entirety of it, and the smoke filled the place. And what did he say? What did Isaiah say? Holy man of God, prophet of God, what did he say? Woe is me. I'm undone. I've got... Nothing to stand on. No accolades to brag about. No credentials to make God think of me as greater than I am. Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell with the people of unclean lips. I mean, do y'all see that? It wasn't until he had a vision of God. What are you trying to say, Josh? I'm telling you, we need a daily engagement encounter with God. No, you're not going to, and I'm not going to see God in this heavenly temple view and all this. No, but here's the thing. We've got to have encounters with God. We've got to pursue him. We've got to pursue him. Remember Paul? Saul, when he was terrorizing the church, Acts chapter 9, it says that he was going to Damascus and it said that the Lord appeared to him brighter than the noonday sun and he fell down 
couldn't see anything, but he asked, Who are you, Lord? And from that day forward, change. Change. But it, it's not just changed. A lot of you sitting here this morning as followers of Jesus Christ, your life has been changed because you've been given life. You were dead in your transgressions. Y'all remember that Ephesians 2, 1, dead. Physical bodies alive, spiritually dead to God, and he gave you the Zoe life, like he gave you spiritual life. There has been a radical change, but just like with Isaiah, just like with Paul, and every other believer, and every other believer coming after you, they continue to grow up in their relationship with Jesus because they took it serious. They took it serious. They pursued him, and they grew up, as it says in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, up in their salvation. Look on the screen with me as Paul just contemplates his own life in Romans 7, 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am. Paul from the outside is squeaky clean. What are you going to blame him for? Paul's not a liar. Paul's not a people pleaser. Paul's not a thief. Paul's not someone who bends on things, okay? Like, what in the world, from a human perspective, does he have to do with saying, oh, wretched man that I am? Is that just pious talk? No. This is when we, as Christians, Christians above all, are the most realistic people in the world. Not to say you're not going to meet some kooky ones in the midst of it. But they are the most realistic. We are the most realistic people because we can see God for who he is and therefore see ourselves and our future for who we are and what they will be. Most realistic people on the face of the earth, wretched man that I am, he can see himself. His standard's not against a fellow person. It's against the standard that God has set for him, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. When you look at his letters, it's not on the screen, but when you look at his letters, Paul continued to grow in humility. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. It says, for I am the least of the apostles. And this is around A.D. 56, A.D. 57. He's over here saying, I'm, I'm the least. You know what's crazy? He did the most. Quantitatively, he did the most. Persecution, he received the most. Sacrifice, he gave the most. Nobody's like Paul. And what is he doing? I'm the least of the apostles. For I persecuted the church. You see how he sees himself? And you're like, well, he must have been sad all the time. No, he's in prison writing to the Philippians. He's like, rejoice always in the Lord. His first encounter in prison in Philippi, when you read in the book of Acts, is what? Him and Silas, after getting beaten with rods at midnight, are singing psalms to God, praises to God. He's not miserable. He is, however, realistic. He is, however, in tune with God. He is, however, spiritually healthy. He says this. Three or four years later, in Ephesians 3, 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, I'm the least of the apostles four years ago. <laughs> Honestly, the more I've grown with the Lord, the, I'm the least of all Christians. <laughs> I'm nobody. First Timothy, he says this, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. That's another almost... Three years later, he says this. Foremost, if you got King James, it says chief. I'm numero uno. I am the worst that God has to offer. And if he can save me, he can save you. He can forgive me. He can forgive you. Paul grew in his humility as he continued forth and moved forward in his life. Do you want to know something? As you grow closer to the Lord, you're going to have a greater sensitivity of sin. As you grow closer to the Lord, you will have a greater sensitivity of sin. It does not mean as you get older that you will have a greater sensitivity of sin because if you don't spend time with God, you will be desensitized to the things of God. Y'all follow me this morning, church? 
if you do not draw near unto the Lord, just because you had a vibrant relationship with God three years ago, because you begin to study the word of God, because you begin to prioritize time with God in the morning or in the middle of the day or at night, whatever it was, it does not mean that three years later, five years later, 20 years later, just because you're older, that somehow or another, you're closer to the Lord or you're more sensitive to the things of God. You have to spend time with God to be sensitive and in tune with God. You, you got to. I've got to. I can feel it when I don't. 100% can feel it. And not only can I feel it, I can hear it. I can hear those words that come out of my mouth. I can see the actions and the quick temper. I can, I can feel it. You can. The scary part is when some of us in here this morning, we don't even have a clue about that. Because we never even know what it's like to actually be in step with the Spirit, close with, the God, close with God. We swear we've made the prayer, but we're not close. We don't prioritize that. Mourning over sin is a sign of spiritual health. And third and close is this. Consolation from God is experienced in this life for those who mourn and fully in the life to come. So this is, so you can't just take the first part of the verse and not take the last part, right? Blessed are those who mourn. You're like, man, that's, that seems like bad news. No, 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 that, that's good news. If you want, you want to know if you're maturing in Christ, how sensitive to you, or how sensitive are you to the things of God? How about this? I'll say it a different way. Rather than thinking about sin, let's, let's go in a more positive direction. How aware are you on a daily basis of God's presence actively in your life? Yesterday. Yesterday. How aware are you of God's presence with you, abundantly blessing you, just yesterday? Friday. Thursday. A month ago, a year ago. How, how aware are you? I'm telling you, the more you're sensitive to the things of God and the more you're aware of sin in your life, the greater the joy is going to be. Because when you realize how good God has been, is being, and will be continually to his people, you have nothing else but to do is just shout praise to God. and like, God, you are so good to me. You have been so good to me. You have been so kind to me. You've been so gracious to me, God. I have nothing else to do but to say and to sing your praises like you. I'm just thankful. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful to be here. Consolation from God is experienced for those in this life. It's not just something we've got to wait for, but also fully in the life to come. When you remind yourself every day about what God has forgiven you of and the future that God has given you as a son or daughter of God, that should get you excited. That does not mean bad things don't happen in this life. You know they do. They do. But it does mean you can have joy in spite of the circumstances. How good is it to start each day knowing your sins have been forgiven? Do you ever do that? You're like, I'm not a morning person. It has nothing to do with starting your day thanking God for the fact that your sins are forgiven. You're like, but I'm always kind of like just down and out. Like, that could be a great way to start your day. I, thank you, Lord. Starting my day out, I don't enjoy waking up in the morning. Lord, help us. But I want to thank you this morning that I'm alive. You've given me opportunities to glorify your name, to know you more, to share you in greater capacity. Thank you for forgiving me. How good is it at night to go to bed without a guilty conscience? There's been times in my life where I've definitely been aware of sin in my life where I was just like, I need to do something to rectify the situation. But like David, read Psalms 32 as well if you really want some insight on that. The bones rotting inside of you, just feeling this heavy weight and burden where I didn't do what I know I needed to do. Confess what I needed to confess. Apologize to who I needed to apologize. Tried to reconcile that situation. How good is it to go to bed at night and sleep with a clear conscience? First and foremost, clear before God. And clear with your fellow man. 
This is true in this life, but also it's true in the one to come. If you'll put on the screen behind me, Revelation, this is the last verse, and we close. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, y'all ready? Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I'll give from the springs of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers, church, the one who's faithful to the end. Church, the one who knows that they're poor in spirit. The one who mourns over the sin in their life and the sin in the world, like, The ones who are his. To the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all the liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Two futures. Where will we choose? Who will we live for? For the gospel is this. We're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared Timothy Keller such a good summation let's stand let us pray Father we come before you this morning telling you we love you Lord God I pray that we could use this time as an opportunity of confession of crying out to you oh God and just saying Lord heal me forgive me Make me sensitive, Lord God. Help me to be sensitive to sin in my life. Help me to be aware of maybe things I'm I'm not even, I don't even know. I'm not even aware of them. I'm not even aware of maybe the way I've been saying things or treating or the tone or all the above. Lord, help me to be aware. Help us to be aware. Father, may we live for you here and now so that we may be comforted here and now but forevermore. May this last song of praise this morning together as a family may it be a reflection of our heart. Father, any of those who need prayer, Father, may they come forward. May they receive prayer. May they just come and kneel at the front. May this just be a time when they draw near to you for that is the promise that you will draw near to them. It's in Jesus we pray. Thank you.